Most people, unless your parents are exorbitantly wealthy and have achieved everything that you wish to achieve, I don't think you should listen to your parents. And so one of my first rules of life is never to listen to someone who's poorer than you or poorer than you want to be. So that's two different caveats there because you might be younger and it's like, okay, well, yeah, my parents have more money than me, but like, are they poorer than you want to be? If so, then only listen to people who are wealthier than you want to be. And the thing is, is that they always will side on the side of being less risky. And here's why. Because when you naysay, if someone's like, oh, I don't like your girlfriend. And the thing is, is that if you date in general, then fundamentally every single person that you date, except for the one that you marry is going to be somebody who you're not going to be with. And if someone says, I don't think this person's good, then they will be right literally 99% of the time, except for the one time that matters. Kind of interesting. And so the thing is, is most businesses fail. 95% of businesses fail within five years. And so most times they are correct. And so it's very easy for them to self-reinforce that they are so smart and they're always right. And they can tell you, I told you so. But the reality is that they are wrong in the 1% of times that it matters in your life. Need motivation? Watch the top 10 with Believe Nation. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and I make these videos because you are probably the most ambitious person in your circle. But you know you're capable of more, and you get that push by surrounding yourself with the best. So today, let's learn from one of the best, Alex Hormozzi, and my take on his top 10 was a success. Enjoy. When I think about this, what's interesting is that, like, the only way that is guaranteed to not get to success is to never take the risk to begin with, right? That's the guaranteed way of not achieving it. And I remember when I was quitting my job, that was the biggest conclusion that I came to was that I was not happy at my current earning level and that the only job, because there was one position, one job that made enough money that I wanted, which was being an investment banker. So the best investment bankers can make 10, $20 million a year. But I knew what it was required to get there and the amount of effort, time and sacrifice. And I was like, the only people who will pay me that amount of money, um, will be making so much more money off of me, <laughs> literally draining my life, that I don't think it's, because like usually if you become an investment banker that's successful, you pretty much donate 20 years of your life in order to do that. Um, and you're you're really never gonna see your family and all that kind of stuff. And for me, that was not a, tr a trade-off I wanted to make. And so I figured there was no job that was gonna pay me what I wanted to make and afford me the lifestyle that I wanted. And so the path that I was on was guaranteed to not get me to where I wanted to go. And so even though it was micro risky, it was macro the only way I could do it, right? And so that's one of those like, uh, one of those things actually like from Gary Vee that he says, micro speed, macro patience, right? Money loves speed, wealth loves time. And so if we're trying to build wealth, if we're trying to build an asset, right? Then we need to have time. One of my other favorite sayings that I'll share with you is um, uh, you get paid for what you do, you get returns on what you own. Right. And so anyways, back to the back to the reason why you shouldn't listen to um, other people is that they don't have an accurate understanding of risk. Right. And the biggest risk is not doing anything at all. The biggest risk is never dating, not that you're with this person. Right. And so Warren Buffett said, and I like this, he said, most people only need to make four or five really good decisions in their life. So think about that for a second, because I think about like that one really shook me because I think about all the decisions that I make every single day. Right. And all the decisions that I've made in my life. And there's really not that many of them that have been the biggest levers, but the few that have been, have been massive and enormous levers in my life. And most people don't take enough time to think about those decisions that are the massive forks in the road. Am I gonna keep going in this position? Do I wanna live in this city? Am I gonna marry this girl? Who am I gonna go to, uh, who am I gonna get into business with? Uh, what are we gonna do? Right? What are we actually going to do in this business? And so people don't give, put enough thought into that stuff and spend all their time thinking about what, their, what next show they're going to watch on Netflix, right? rather than thinking like, I'm going to take some time with this decision. Because one of my other sayings is, mistakes love a rushed decision. right? So micro speed, macro patience. If you're looking at long, playing long, then you have to understand, or at least this is my, you know, my, my two cents on it, is that most people will oppose you at all times. And that is because it is safer for them to do so. Because they will be right most of the times. But on the 1% of times that they are wrong, it's that 1% decision saying that you're going to buy C's candies for $25 million and ends up generating a billion dollars, right? In revenue, it's that one decision that they're going to miss out on. And that's the one decision that matters. And so they are 99% of the time right, but they're hundred percent wrong, right? And so that's the only message that I wanted to really drive home is that if you have parents who make less money than you want to make, if you have friends who make less money than you want to make, I had so many people who told me that everything I was doing was stupid. I was giving up a really good consulting job to open a gym, right? I took all my savings and sunk it into a business. And you know what? That business wasn't the one that set me free. It was four, four or five businesses from there. But I learned the skills that one by one, I was able to assemble and assemble on a belief standpoint of the world with the character traits to reinforce them to eventually yield the success that some people think is you know, cool. Rule number two, study wealth. I started studying wealth after I became wealthy. Mm. So like, what did you learn about it afterwards? And what do wealthy people do that you think poor people don't do? They pick higher leverage opportunities in a sentence. So like, 
poor, rich dad, poor dad. Like poor dad says, get a job. Poor dad says, get a higher paying job. Like rich dad says, like, and, and the thing is, there's so many innate beliefs that seem commonplace. Like, well, of course, you know what I mean? Like, well, of course, you know, and you know, you buy some real estate and you know, it'll appreciate over time. Of course you invest in some stocks. Like, yeah, of course. But like, Poor dads just don't say that. And so you have to like learn that, I think. And I didn't, so I'm grateful in that I didn't have to learn that because I heard mm -hmm. that just was, a, of course, yeah, once you have some money, like, of course you don't spend your whole income. Of course you don't. And so there's a lot of, of course you don'ts that I think I, I inherited just by being in like a saving father. But there's also some upper middle class people who don't save anything. So like, right. but I think my dad did a lot of, I think he helped a lot with like money hygiene. Mm, I think I've, nice. I've had a lot of really good money hygiene from my dad. The big, the big breakthrough that I had for me was when I stopped focusing on, and this is going to sound backwards, but when I started my gyms, I was all about building the business, right? And when I built the biggest companies that I've had and now recently sold, and now we have our portfolio, it was about how do we make the most money? And I know that com sounds completely backwards, but the only way that you can make the most money is to provide an exceptional valued service and charge a ton of money for it. And because I optimized around making money, I, I started going through for low capital expense businesses because I had lost everything after that five year stint. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, never again am I gonna reinvest every dollar from the business back into the business because I've lost it before. So th when I started the, the next business and every business I've had thereafter, like we take dividends every month. And we do that because you don't wait till there's an exit ten exactly. years later. No, I mean, put all I'd your love, money in. I'd love to do both. Yeah, yeah. Why not both? Sure. Right. And so that was take the, a dividend and get a bigger of course. Pay. Yeah, but and not just put money in and wait and get no money back. A hundred percent. And the thing is, is and this was a fallacy I had because people always talk about like reinvesting in their business, but I realized that that just meant that they weren't making profit. And so, <laughs> and so the vast majority of businesses, even the software world, is, is somewhat shifting in this. Um, but they want to see profit, and then even better is if you have net free cash flow, which is just a fancy word for the amount of money that you can take out every month after making necessary investments in the business. And so I wanted to have businesses that pumped cash flow uh, because I had lost it all before. And right. so I think there's a lot of, like every, every one of my business seasons, I've, I would say I've had three uh, business seasons. I had my gym ownership period, I had my uh, turnaround and early gym launch day period, and then I had Prestige Labs, the licensing business, and Allen. That was like my last season. Where you exited yeah, all of them. Yeah. yeah. And then I say like now we're in we're in our this our third season, I guess. So brick and mortar gyms, licensing, supplements, and software. software. Yeah. And then, you know, third season is what we have now. And each of those has a huge, huge magnitude of leverage that was added to it. Mm. And so, you know, this is like, Gym Launch was started on accident in that I was like, this might be a way that I could make money. Rule number three, develop good skills. You absolutely just need skills. You can have nothing else in your life. And a beautiful thing is that no government can take it from you. No person can take your skills from you in a divorce. Um, those are always your own, uh, which is something that, I don't know, for some reason feels magical to me. And so one of the things that I've seen as I've kind of, you know, moved moved up, I'm not saying that arrogantly, just, you know, just developed, progressed, whatever, um, is that the people who I surround myself with now have more money than the people that I surrounded myself when I was early on in my career. And what's ironic is that these people actually spend less money. <laughs> they, they, have, they have less desire to spend money. And they find ways to acquire things for less money out of pocket. And um, that's always really interesting to me. And so right now, I think there's, you know, if you were to, if you were to look at quote investment opportunities, right? Um, you could, you could, you know, invest in buying a house. So let's say, let's say you've got, um, I'll do two scenarios. All right. Let's say you've got $50,000. All right. And you're like, okay, I'm thinking about buying uh, a house. Right. And I think for a first house, you might only have to put 10% down. I'm not sure it's 10 or 20. Yeah. I don't remember. But anyways, let's just say 10 for, for sake of whatever. So $500,000 house, all right, you put 10% down and then you get the mortgage, right? You get the liability of the mortgage payment every month. Yippee. Um, now, if you were to, if you were to, and let's say that in order for you to save that, you've been making, I don't know, 60 grand a year and you've been saving that for, you know, five years, something like that. Now, let's look at an alternative scenario where you um, are still making that same amount of money, 60, and you saved up 50. And instead of buying a house, you have a long conversation with your spouse and you say, or maybe you don't have a spouse, whatever, with yourself. And you say, I wonder how much money I could get for this money. 
Ah, interesting, right? And so you, you, you leaf through the businesses that are in your area. And by the way, um, the best way to do that is one, you should contact brokers, not necessarily to buy a business, but to get an idea of some of the businesses that are in the area and what price ranges look like. But if you buy from a broker, you're gonna pay retail. You could definitely negotiate a deal. And I'll tell you one of the deals that I did that was really good at the end of this. Um, but uh, anyways, so let's say you, you, know, you, you reach out to some businesses, things that you like or enjoy or feel like you have some specialized knowledge in, and uh, you find out that there's a business that's doing, let's say, I don't know, $250,000 a year in, uh, in, in profit, right? And uh, because it's a small local owned business and you're not gonna pay retail for it, you get it for two and a half you know, times earnings, right? Which would be, uh, what's two and a half times? Uh, it's 525, hopefully, I think. Two and a half, no, that's 625, excuse me. $625,000 is what a business, you might pay for businesses doing $250,000 a year in profit, all right? Now here's where, it, here's where it's interesting, right? So I had um, an early mentor who, who taught me this negotiation tactic that I've used pretty much for, throughout my entire life since this moment, and I, and I used it in the deal that I'll tell you about in a second, which is agree on price, then agree on terms, right? And so when you, when you would go to quote, talk to this business, right? There's, there's the price, which you might say, cool, you know, this business is 625, and then there's terms, right? And so the term side, once you've agreed on the price, you negotiate down, whatever, and then you say, okay, well, I'm gonna need you to sell or finance, meaning you're not gonna pay anything, you're gonna pay them over time, right? I need you to sell or finance, uh, you know, three quarters of the deal, all right? And so three quarters of the deal, man, I'm doing some math today, but like 400 and, you know, 30-ish, 437, whatever, $1,000. Um, and you're gonna finance that for, you know, three years, right? And then on top of that, or five years, you know, you can do whatever you want here. I think, um, I mean, you could probably, I mean, you try and push it out as far as you can, right? And then what you have remaining, which would be like, in this instance, $200,000, then you get a note from the bank, right, or SBA loan, which you have a $200,000 um, loan for, and you put your, your $50,000 down, right? So then that would be 200, uh, so you put 50, which would be 25% of 200,000. So I'm gonna recap this. 625 is the cost of the business. You know, 437, you get seller finance, meaning you can pay that over time. And then you've got $200,000 that you get a loan from the bank. So, uh, which you put $50,000 for. So if you're thinking about this, the guy who's selling the business, he sells for 625, but he's only getting 200,000 up front. You're only putting 50 of that 200 and you're taking a loan for the rest of it, right? Um, and so when you're looking at this, you've now acquired this business that makes $250,000 a year, right? So you upgraded your income from 60 to 250,000, right? And within, you know, 24 months, all of that, you know, income will be yours uh, and maybe hopefully you'll grow it or you'll probably try and work extra hard and take over some of the, some of the other positions or cut out some of the waste, et cetera, in the business. And, uh, and, and so that massively speeds you up in life, right? And if you compare that to what it would cost you to start your own business um, in terms of investment and like existing book of business, client lists, all the knickknacks you have to buy that you don't even think of, zoning permits and all the fees and licenses, um, it's actually a pretty decent deal. So um, I'll tell you one of the deals that I did that was pretty good. So I had four locations at this point. This is when I had the gyms and I opened a fifth location. So the first two locations I opened, I opened the first one I think for $40,000. I mean, I, I, put, I, didn't, I put as little as I possibly could in this thing. Um, and it happened to have been an old gym. So there was like turf already in, the flooring was already in, it was painted. Like there was a bunch of things I didn't have to pay for. So I lucked out there. Um, and, but the second one, because I thought I was smarter, I put 200, we put 250,000 into the second location. And here's the fun thing. It made no more money than the first location did, uh, which I always think is hilarious. So like uh, to the undisciplined, everything looks like a spending opportunity. Uh, and so I pretty much would empty my bank account 
And, uh, and so on my fifth location, uh, my next two locations were corporate locations, which were actually pretty cheap, um, which were pretty cool. Those are, those are good deals. But the, the, the fifth location that I did, I had a gym that went out of business or he, not out of business. He wanted to uproot cause his, he got divorced or he had some, some family crisis. And so he was looking for someone to buy his, his, his gym. And so it was beautiful. It had all this equipment that was really expensive in it. And I was like, man, this is like a dream come true. And so I agreed on price because I had my mentor talk me through this. I agreed on price, which I think was 40,000. I think it was 40 grand. It was 40 or 50. I think it was, yeah. So that's what I agreed. And then I was like, cool, I'll pay you over the next year. And he was like, fair enough. And so, I mean, he didn't say it like that. We negotiated and then 12 months is what we, what we came to. And so, I mean, I tried to go for 24 months. <laughs> Uh, but he agreed on 12. And so the beautiful thing with that was I didn't, put, I didn't put any money out of pocket. So, you know, my first gym, I put 50 grand in second gym. I put $250,000 in fifth gym, smarter, more experienced me puts no money in. Right. And in the first 30 days we did 51,000 in sales. So this gym in the first 30 days literally paid for itself period. Right. And so this thing is now kicking off profit, right? Every month during this, during this whole period of time. And then 12 months later, I ended up meeting Russell and telling him how I was doing this stuff. And he's like, you should be teaching other people how to do what you're doing now. And so I ended up selling the gym for one and a half times more than I quote bought it for, right? Which I then had the gym pay for it on its own. And so I basically acquired a cash flowing asset for nothing and then had a, just acquired a cash flowing asset for, for, for no money. And so I think about that um, in light of the original thing that I, I mentioned was just like, I get... I get people who message me all the time, like, what, if, what happens if I don't have any money? I don't know what to do. You always have to just get skills, or this is just my opinion, is that because there's no one who can take them from you, there's no divorce, there's no government, there's no revolution, there's no financial crisis that can ever take your skills from you. And that's why when entrepreneurs hit zero, they can usually bounce back. I've done it. I had $1,100 in my bank account um, at one point at, at, my, at my lowest point after I had six gyms, right? Um, after this. So even when I had this experience and it sounds cool, like I messed up. And, um, you know, that's why I think I love the saying you only you should only have to get rich once. And, um, and that's why people who are wealthy are more risk averse because the downside risk of losing everything is always bigger, right? Like you can reverse 30 years of great decisions with any number multiplied by zero, any number multiplied by zero. You can have a billion dollars. If you make a bad investment, it goes to zero, right? And so that's why when people are like, I don't know why you're motivated and I don't know why uh, there like it's just there's there's just always things that can happen you know what I mean and so just being risk averse is what I have noticed from the people who have the most money is that they actually have way lower risk tolerances than the people who have no money uh, which is hilarious because it's like the people who have the least amount of money uh, then go buy lottery tickets which are literally the worst investment you could possibly make um, and and, and they, they consistently invest their money in a terrible investment that has all the downside risk of going to zero. Whereas the richest people in the world find things that could never go to zero and they buy them for zero. So think about that for a second. People are using their money, poor people use their money to buy things that have virtually guaranteed you know, risk of going to zero, right? With tiny risk of, uh, of upside, right? Whereas rich people, buy stuff for zero dollars that have um, upside potential, but that doesn't, that doesn't have a billion dollar upside potential. They would rather have a guaranteed small return with no risk than a potential for huge return with guaranteed risk. Think about that. So um, anywho, I think if it, over time, and it's not like you can shift your perspective on this overnight. It took me a long time and I still am doing it now um, in shifting how, like, cause I still get excited about, you know, I see these, you know, these, these, these cryptocurrencies 20 xing and stuff, you know, in like a month. And I'm like, man, that's crazy. Um, but then I also think like, well, the downside risk of me going to zero is far more upsetting to me than me getting 20 times more on some tiny investment that I would make. Um, and so I, I don't do it. Right. And so anyways, um, I say all this to say, uh, agree on price, agree on terms, Try and get something for nothing. See if you're gonna if you're gonna make an investment in any kind, or you're trying to start a business. There's usually a business that's already for sale or has a motivated seller, an owner who doesn't want to do it anymore, who will almost give it to you for free, right? And that's the thing is when you're new, you're getting so excited, but you're not patient, 
right? That's why you have to have the character traits of being successful before you will see the success. Because if you, if you have that character trait, you'll look and you'll say, I can take six months because in the, in the, decade of my, in the next decade of my life, there's no rush. But me making a good deal or a bad deal of like, should I put all my investment in this thing or should I be able to get something that makes four times more money for free? You can do that. You can do that. And I'm telling you, I talk to business owners every day. I mean, guys making a million, two million, four million dollars a year who literally have told me, they're like, dude, if someone came today and offered me, like guys who are making a million dollar, a million dollars a year in profit, or like if someone had offered me 200 grand right now, I would take it. I just am so tired of this business. So like there are opportunities. They're just not listed anywhere. You just got to look for them. Rule number four, manage your expectations. I think that expectations are literally the thing that will destroy your life uh, or will make your life. And many of us, uh, I think many people in general have you know, figured out, and many world religions have figured this out, which is uh, you know, the secret to happiness is uh, haves over wants, uh, which is, let's say you have, you know, have one thing and you want nothing, you will be infinitely happy. The problem is where you might have a million things, but you want two million things and you will not be happy, right? And so you can simply change how happy you are by expecting less. And so one of the things that I specifically wanted to address today was the expectations around education. And the reason this is a really meaningful topic for me is that I've, I think I've talked to you about my neighbor um, and watching him go through the, the crazy expectations that he has as a young person has been really valuable for me because I've also seen a lot of those characteristics that he has in myself just add zeros to it, but it's still fundamentally the same thing. And that's what's been, uh, it's, it's, it's been meaningful for me. And so anyways, uh, I have tried to frame things. Uh, so if you are trying to learn things, which is going to be the first step to any kind of entrepreneurial endeavor, is I like to liken everything to a bridge because I th think it's a simple visual. So imagine where you are on one side of you know this this valley, right, is where you are. And where you want to go is on the other side of this big valley, right? And you have a bridge that goes across the two sides. Now, the problem is, is that people will buy things. They will buy courses. They will buy mentorships. They'll buy workshops. They'll buy seminars. They'll buy events. They'll buy whatever, right? In an effort on some level to get over this bridge, right, of where they are to where they want to go. And it could be from zero to $100,000 a year. It could be from a million dollars a month to $2 million a month. It could be from $100 million a year to a $1 billion a year. Whatever it is, there's a bridge, right? And <clears throat> along that bridge are bricks. And I like to liken um, each skill as a brick on the way to where you're trying to go. And the problem with the expectations of somebody who's trying to learn a skill or achieve a goal is that they have a binary outcome. I either achieved it or I did not. I either am making $100,000 or I am not. And the problem is it can be incredibly frustrating because if you have a binary outcome, uh, then it's very easy to get a zero out of one, right? Where the reality is, most things are, exist on a continuum. And so this is the difference between a psychological binary and, a, and, and the biological continuum, which is, I'll give you a couple of examples. So it's not, uh, uh, are you diabetic? Are you not diabetic? It's how diabetic are you, right? It's not, uh, are, are you smart or are you dumb? But it's how smart are you, right? And so we like to psychologically bucket things into yes, no's because it's simpler for us, but it, it, it misses actual reality, right? And this can be especially dangerous as we're trying to acquire new skills. And so the reason I liken this, and I think it's so dangerous in education, uh, because that's what we're doing, right? If we're trying to educate ourselves, we're trying to acquire skills, is that we think as we're trying to get across this bridge that let's say you buy a course on copywriting, right? And so you're on one side of the bridge, you buy a course on copywriting, and then you still aren't a millionaire. Wow, right? The problem is, uh, you may have put another brick on your bridge. You may be closer to where you were to, to getting to the other side of the bridge. You just haven't achieved it yet. And so this is one of the issues that I also see um, just in general. Like it's so funny because in the, in the, in the I'll, I'll say quote guru world, um, you know, people will take on a coach, that coach will move them forward you know, to a certain degree. And then they'll take another coach and that coach will move them forward to a certain degree and so forth and so on. And then the thing is, is that they're, they're like, I'm working with so-and-so, I used to work with that person, they suck, right? But the problem, and I used to do this, right? Like, and this is why I think it's so ridiculous. 
um, is that like if you were looking at your schooling, right, and you had a had a third grade math teacher, and then later you had a calculus teacher, you wouldn't be like, screw that third grade, ma you know, cal uh, math teacher. The stuff that I'm learning from this guy is so much, you know, more advanced, whatever, right? And I've had, you know, a lot of our clients say that about their franchises that they work with and things like that. And I just, it, it drives me nuts because it's, it's, it's stupid. You know, it's for lack of a word, it's stupid. Because a lot of times you need, you need step one to get to step two, right? And you don't have to, and it's because people have psychological issues, but like they, they can't, they can't say I've learned from all of these people, right? And it doesn't, it doesn't decrease your status to say I've learned from many teachers. Look at all the richest people in the world. They say like, I've had multiple mentors. I've had so many people help me out over the years. And I think if you can shift that perspective, it will be incredibly valuable for you. Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight all of the lessons learned in this video, as well as pull out our three favorite learnings and quotes that will inspire you to actually do something. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free, there's a link in the description below. Go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business. I'll see you there. Rule number five, quiet your ego. I think that the whole ego death concept that we were talking about at the very beginning, I try not to talk about this too much because I think it's, it's um, a lot of people find uh, take offense to it, and I don't mean it that way. I, I share this is just what worked for me and not as a criticism of any, anyone else's beliefs. For me, the idea that there was no such thing as legacy, mm -hmm. that when I died, eventually, everything that I had would become dust, and that anything expanded over a long enough time horizon disappears, right? Which if you are like Christian, for example, it's the whole book of Ecclesiastes. Um, if you, and I think the realization of that allowed me to quiet my ego a lot um, so that I could be more present in the idea that like this moment will only be here in my mind and anything that I do here will not last. And so it shifted how I worked, it shifted how I saw relationships. And a lot of my thinking is around like my 85 year old self. I feel like the, my number one mentor is like my fictitious 85 year old self because it's the only person that I really believe has my best interest at heart and has no ulterior motive. And so there's this, there's this tweet that I had that went pretty viral, but it was like listening to a billionaire or a millionaire, I'll just use that. Like when I was in my 20s, I wanted to be a millionaire. And when I was a millionaire, I wanted to be in my 20s. Mm. And so the idea that my future self would trade all the money he had to be poor in 20 again made me really reanalyze how I saw living life in the moment. If I literally in the future will value my present moment more than the achievement of the thing that I'm, I'm seeking right now in the present, then something's, something's off. Because even my future self knows that. Because right now I would pay all the money I have to get 10 years back. Isn't that Not even thinking about it. And so then all of what I'm going to achieve in the next 10 years, I would happily give up to be right where I am right now. And so I think thinking about that really shifted a lot for me because it helped me quiet, I'm not saying eliminate, but quiet some of the thoughts that are more ego driven um, because the ego always wants to like separate and isolate from others and prove that it's better. Mm. And if I know that it will all be dust, there is no better because we're all going to be dust. And so in that same way, if like, if we're all going to be dust and we're all siblings, like two very strong frames right. for me at least, it helped me quiet that aspect. And I think in that way I was able, I think, you can ask my people, but like, I think I, I was able to show up better as a leader. I think I was better mm. able to show up better as a husband, um, show up better like to make content, things like that. Like, I don't think I could have made the stuff we make now five years ago because I still think it would have been more, it would have been too proving me. something. Yes. Right? Yeah. It was Perfect. Numbers, it. proving. 100% have been proving, proving someone, proving a fictitious foe wrong. <laughs> right. Right. They're right. all talking about me. Right, like, right. No one about cares you. about yeah, you. No, <laughs> exactly. And so that was really, and it's like, I had to shift from like, no one cares about you to like, I really want to have a shirt that says no lives matter, but I feel like it would oh, be yeah, way yeah, too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, one, no one cares about you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I feel, but I think there's like a lot of like meat to that where it's yeah, like, if yeah. we can, cause in that way we are all equal. Mm -hmm. And so it's, I think it's almost the most egalitarian perspective is that like in the end we will all be dust. Yeah. And so I think in that way, that's like, we have these exchanges that we have 
um, and in some ways it makes it more beautiful. Rule number six, be the best version of yourself. Why are you trying to change people's perception of you when you can just change who you are and let their perceptions catch up? The only way you're gonna change your reputation is by being different. He's like, you need to stop being this person that does all these things and your reputation will catch up. And even if it doesn't, you'll always know. I, and I, honestly, it barely scratched the surface because my ego was so high and I was like, no, I just have to think of a better way to like market myself. But I ended up knowing that he was very serious about the threat of pulling me out of school if I didn't get my grades up. And so what I ended up doing for the next half of the semester of my first semester of freshman year is I didn't go out at all. I didn't drink anymore. I really didn't like hang out with girls at all. And all I did was study. And I was able to pull my, it might've been one, two. It was very low, up to a 3.2 for the semester, which basically meant I got an A on everything from that point for the rest of the semester. And so when I went back home, he was like, well, now you know you can do it. And so we should always expect that that is what you're gonna get from here on out. And it also kind of proved it to myself too. I was like, I guess I can do this. And you know what happened is after I started switching that way, people still thought of me as a whore. And I still had to deal with that. It took like two years to really reverse the reputation that I had acquired in the first three months. I think during that period of time, I grew an appreciation for how easy it is, especially in first impressions, to set the wrong one and how hard it is to overcome a negative impression. And my reputation overall, the realization I had was there's too many people that you're interacting with in the world to try and curate reputation. The only way to change your reputation is to change who you are. Reputation is fundamentally just what people say about you, to your face and behind your back. I'm not saying that you need to care about what everyone else thinks. That's not really the point of this. It's much more, if one person says you're an asshole, whatever. If every person you know says you're an asshole, like you might be an asshole. And so if you have one of those situations where you feel like the proof or the evidence is overwhelming and you might even believe it, then it's probably you. I think that for me, getting out of the whole, like I can control this and try and curate what people think about me and transitioning to be like, at the end of the day, I'm the only person who knows who I am and I don't like who I am. And just saying like, well, how can I get to a point where I would like me? Even if everyone else hated me, how can I like me? When I started operating from that place, it really changed my life because then I started thinking like, what version of me do I wanna be? And what does that guy do? Well, that guy studies really hard and that guy works out really hard. And that guy's a really good friend. He's always respectful, doesn't have an ego. And it took me a long time and I still work on this stuff. You know what I mean? I'm not saying I'm done by any, any search of the imagination. But I think that if you can simply shift the perspective of like, I'm going to try and appear this way to like, I want to be this way. If it just so happens to get captured, great. And if it doesn't, Great. And there's this, this quote by Epictetus that I'm probably gonna butcher, but he says, if you need someone else to tell you something about yourself, you are out of integrity because you can always be your own witness. I think that that's a, a great point to wrap the this little video lesson up with because that piece strikes to the core of everything, which is we are our own witnesses. And if we want to change our reputation, we need to change our reputation with ourselves first. And then eventually, it will reflect in the world. Rule number seven, use negativity to grow. Envy is having the, the desire for something that someone else has that you do not have. So you are lacking and someone else has something that you want and do not have. That is envy. Jealousy is when you have a threat that someone is going to take something that you have that they do not have. All right, and so for example, I'll give you an example of each. So envy, I may be envious of a friend of mine. So um, I was actually talking to a good friend of mine who runs a big weight loss company. And right now he's doing better than I am. And now I am envious of his success. I am, I can feel it. I'm envious, I got off the phone and I was like, I am envious of you, right? On the flip side, if someone comes to talk to Layla, right? It is the fact that they pose the threat of taking attention or her attention that I think should continuously belong to me that I would feel jealous over. I haven't had, I haven't felt jealousy in a long time, um, but that is that is an example. It could also be like with your kids, if you have some, you know, some other adult in their life starts taking their attention or has more influence over them, you are jealous of the influence that that person is now th is threatening your influence over your child, right? So two examples, they're nuanced, but I think it's important, and. When I was talking to Nick Barely about this, I was talking about how I think envy um, gets a bad rap. And I'm not gonna go into the spiritual religious side of this or even the happiness side of this because I think envy absolutely does not make you happy. But I do think that envy will make you successful. All right, and so this, this is where I wanna kind of dive into this. 
Envy is adaptive, right? As human beings, this is actually from our old brain, right? So this is animals have this too. They are envious of one another. And it's because if in a group, one person or one being, one animal, whatever, brings more to the table, you are now envious of that person. And what it does is it elevates the rest of the group to go and achieve the same, which is good for the collective. Not happier for each of the individuals, but as a pro-survival tool, right? And so for me, understanding this and at least being able to name the emotion rather than saying, I don't like this guy or I'm angry at this person or having this negative feeling that you cannot put words to, instead being able to say, I am envious has been very relieving for me because now I can actually tell those people, hey, I'm envious of you. And for some reason, I think it just creates another level of candor because it's a certain level of vulnerability and saying, you have something that I wish I had, but then you'll notice that the conversation is not defensive on that person's part. Most of the time they're like, well, let me help you. And it's only when we guise our intentions or, or, try and, or try and feign, you know, pretend to be a different way than we are, where people also can sense that you're being disingenuous. Like, great job, man, right? When realize deep down, and they can tell from your, your subtle tonality changes and the way you look, that the, um, that you're actually not happy for them, right? And so I think if you can at least say it, then it actually gives you power. Now, in terms of judging your motivations, because obviously you might think that envy is a bad uh, motivation. It is my belief that I would rather deal with people who do good things for bad reasons than bad reasons for good things. Um, or I said the same thing twice, but uh, they do the right thing for the wrong reasons rather than the wrong things for the right reason. All right, I'd rather someone who does the right outcome. And he gave me an example that was really powerful. He said a friend of his um, was a top Navy SEAL and uh, you know, one of the best Navy SEALs. He trains Navy SEALs, just a total badass, right? And before that, he was an EMT. And he talked about his experiences being an EMT is that most people think you know, EMTs have to be really caring. They, you want them to, you know, they have to save these people's lives every day. And he said, uh, the Navy SEAL was saying, I was not compassionate at all. I didn't really care that much about the person who was on the table in front of me. But what I did care about was my stats. I cared about the status of being the best. I wanted to have the fastest to the hospital. I wanted to have the highest survival rates, highest success rates of the people that were under my care because I cared about myself being the best. And so the question is, if you were the person who was on the table having a heart attack, would you rather have the compassionate EMT or would you rather have the self-interested EMT who is doing it for status? Well, if it were me, I'd rather have the guy who wanted to pride himself on being the best in the world and didn't give him care about me at all because I knew his result was going to be more pro me than the other person's. And so I think that as, as humans, as entrepreneurs, we judge ourselves a lot on our motivations and our, in and our intentions. But I think that if we can take a step back and A, name the emotion so that it's not this amorphous thing that we can't understand, but then take the next step and say, is this, is this a pro-adaptive uh, emotion? Is this something that's going to help me? Or is this an emotion that's going to drive me to do something that is negative? And I think at least even, even in naming that, we can increase the time between emotion and action. And the further that time gap is in general, the better the quality of the decisions we make because the more rational we are. We're never completely rational because we're, we're emotion-driven beings and we have limbic systems that override things. But the more we can decrease the triggers, uh, the emotional triggers that, that cause us to make bad decisions, ultimately the better decisions we make. And so... I, I, I say all this to say, big picture, first, naming the emotions is important. Second, it creates space so we can make better decisions. Third, we can analyze those decisions and say, is this something that is going to help me in my life or is this something that's going to hurt me? And then as a result of this, we don't have to judge ourselves as strongly on why we are doing things and rather what is being done. Uh, because candidly, I am a very envious individual, and maybe this is me just um, rationalizing my own negative, you know, emotions. Who knows? Um, but at least for me, saying it that way and framing the thought process in that way has helped me feel uh, better about myself, um, and just not, or really just less bad, if that's probably a better way of saying it, um, and not constantly berating myself for having desires that I think are wrong. And so uh, Dan Sullivan said this, and I'll end with this, is that 
when people want something, if you want to make more money, if you want to have a bigger house, you want to have a bigger car, you want to build a podcast studio, whatever, right? He said, wanting is reason enough. Because so many times we ask, but why do we want that? We're probably not going to change the desire. And so letting, us, letting ourselves desire things and giving ourselves permission to desire things, uh, and myself specifically, um, has been incredibly freeing. And what it's done is given me a tremendous amount of my attention back that used to be allocated to analyzing why I'm feeling this way or why this is right or why this is wrong. And instead accepting the fact that I want something and that wanting it is okay, as long as it is not something that is hurting other people and that is not something that is hurting me. Rule number eight, observe your behavior. How do we behave? The reason that this is so important is that it's one thing to know where you're going, but it's another thing to know how you're going to get there. And so this is just as true in business partnerships and marriage in terms of what you want uh, to have happen and how you want to get there um, as it is in business, okay? And so what I wanna do is actually just walk you through the three values that we have at acquisition.com and why we believe them. And so from an overarching perspective, the way to come to values um, is to look at what are the non-negotiable Okay. And so what I mean by that is, and, and every company is different because the core thing about values is that they have to be things that are true and innate to you, right? Like for example, at Southwest, uh, have fun is one of their core values. And if someone does not want to have fun or does not believe in the processes that they do to have a good time, then that is a non-negotiable for them. That person cannot work at that company. It is a fireable offense. And so these are not aspirational. These are not things that you would like to have. These are things that are core to who you are as a person and as a team, all right? And so when you decide on these non-negotiables, they are by their very nature non-negotiable, which means that you hire based on these, you fire based on these. And these are the core spirit of the team. And some of the mistakes that I see when people make values is that one, they don't draw the line in the sand. And so one of the core things about a value is that it has to, you have to be able to say, this is not this, right? You have to be able to say, okay, between justice and mercy, we lean towards justice or we lean towards mercy, which means you have to repel people with your values, all right? And so if your values do not repel people, then they are not values, they are platitudes, okay? And so it's very important. The next thing is that when you're making your values, the values themselves need to be ideally said in words that you would normally say. So if you have little sayings inside of your community, then then a lot of times those can become some of the values you have. So for example, at Gym Launch, one of our first portfolio companies, uh, speed is king, do the boring work. These were different ways. I mean, we could just say work ethic, but that's not the way we would have said it. We could have said be fast or fast turnaround times, but speed is king was the way we would have said it, okay? And so some of the things that I've learned with this is also, you cannot have too many values, as in, I'll say it differently. You can have too many values. You have to be very selective at the, the true core values of the company. All right. And so if you're, you know, between two, a lot of times you just have to chunk up uh, and kind of get a broader value, but they become the core. And I think that what we have found is that three is the sweet spot. And that number has continued to distill down over time. But I think three is the amount that your human brain can comprehend as lenses to make a decision, right? And the reason these values are so important is that when you scale the company, you have to scale decision making, which means you have to scale the frame with which you duplicate the decision making process. Process, which is, should I hire this person, even though Alex is not involved in this, do they align with the core values? And the more stringent the values, the easier it is to have a black and white example of, I think this person meets two out of the three or one out of three, but we only accept three out of three. And I will tell you this as an additional point, if you have core values in the business, I would relay them to all aspects of your life. If you would not do business with someone for a, a decade, do not do business with them for a day. It's one of the Navalisms that I like a lot. And so if you wouldn't, if you don't want to deal with this client for a decade, don't deal with them for a day. If you wouldn't deal with this employee for a decade, don't deal with them for a day. You have to, and, and the extent to which you hold your line of intolerance around these truly non-negotiables will dictate the health of the organization. And if you make these non-negotiables and realize that there are people in your organization in your client base that do not ascribe to these, then you must make the changes to fix it. And that is the pruning of the tree that will ultimately grow the tree, all right? These are the short-term pains for the long-term gains. Rule number nine, shift your perspective. I think the single greatest differentiator between the poor and the middle class, middle class and rich, rich and the truly wealthy, is how they see time. 
Mm. And if you think about money as simply a condensed unit of time, right? That's all money is. Like you trade it for time. I mean, you can trade time for money. So like it is, they're almost equivalent units. And the people who know how to master their time the most mean that they know how to master their money the most, right? And so really, if you want to master to the original question of like, how do wealthy people come wealthy is because they master their time. And so time horizon is just like the perspective from which we see what we want to achieve. And so if I am doing, if I'm building a company from the place of like, I believe that this company should exist. I believe this problem is worth solving. And that is where you start it from. Then you build it differently. Versus, versus I need to make money. I need to make money this week. I need to make money tomorrow because- What can I go make money with? Exactly. And so I think like, I mean, you've built this amazing brand here. If, If people were able to not ask for 12 months, and just serve. And the number 10, the last one before some very special bonus clips is take action now. When? Now. Now. It's never gonna work forever. And so I've seen this happen in so many different situations where people will try and give themselves a reason to not even begin something because they think that there is an end to it. When the reality is, the only things that don't actually have an end to them are things that you do not understand. And so if you don't, if you see something as a forever option, then it probably means you do not understand it well enough to begin doing it. So there's a little mind for you. Um, And so let me give you a couple examples to bring this home. So, you know, when I was, you know, in the fitness space, I'd have a lot of people who'd come up to me and be like, hey man, like I want to start working out. I want to get bigger. I was like, awesome. You know, this is how you got to train, blah, blah, blah. And they'd be like, well, I don't want to get too big. I'm like, you don't even look like you work out. So why don't we start with that? And then we can worry about you getting too big, right? So it's not a perfect example for business, but that's an example of somebody trying to discount starting because they think they see an end that they do not even understand the journey well enough to comprehend. Another example would be, hey, we're running TikTok ads right now and we're crushing it, right? And someone says, well, we don't know how long TikTok's gonna be around or Snapchat or insert whatever new opportunity there is. And so we don't wanna do it, right? But the reality is all opportunities are by their very nature arbitrage where you're taking advantage of inefficiencies within two systems or two markets. And so over time, all arbitrage disappears, right? And then markets become more efficient. That's how markets work, right? More and more people see the opportunity, the bit, the arbitrage decreases until eventually it's efficient, right? And so when you're looking at opportunities and you see something and it might be a big opportunity, but it only is going to be open for two years, three years, do you do it or not? It's another series of questions that would happen after that, but I would not discount it simply because you know that it is finite because all opportunities are finite. And to take this, exagger- you know, this example to a max degree of exaggeration, think about the Fortune 500. There's only one company that's been on there for over 100 years, and that's GE. Just one. One company, right? And so every one of those companies you might have thought or during their day might have been like, this thing's going to be here forever. But the reality is, it's not. And markets change so rapidly, it's difficult to reshift an entire infrastructure. Some companies can do it, many fail. And so if your business is founded upon taking advantage of an arbitrage opportunity or an inefficiency in a marketplace or something that is fleeting, right, that comes and goes, that's okay. Many businesses were built off of arbitrage opportunities that created cash flow, human resources that could then be deployed and pivoted in another direction when the opportunity closes. And so it's kind of like saying, well, I don't want to invest in this uh, investment because it's only going to triple my money in three years. Well, what do I do after it triples my money? Well, you take the money, you invest it somewhere else, right? It's the same concept, except you're just applying it to your business. And so this is just a caveat that was top of mind that I figured I would share with you because just so many times we try and take 10 steps forward without even realizing that there's this big pile of money and you can just pick it up and move about your life and it doesn't need to be forever. And so it's just a remembering like, if this were an investment, would you triple your money in three years? Probably. So then don't worry about what you're gonna do in 20 years because you're gonna be such a different person then anyways, you might not even wanna be in the same thing forever. And so I think sometimes we just create this reason Because the real reason is that we fear failing when something seems so easy, right? We fear failing 
because we might not think we're good enough or we're being lazy and we don't want to even start or try. And so it's usually the fear thing, but for some people, you just need to get off your ass. Um, but anyways, I hope, I, I hope you found this valuable. Uh, maybe this, you're at a decision right now where you're thinking about investing something or you're thinking about taking advantage of an opportunity or thinking about investing your time into uh, taking advantage of some sort of inefficiency. And uh, if it's a massive one, even if it's going to be fleeting, as long as the return is high enough, I think many times um, it can be worth it. So um, anyways, uh, this is more targeted for newer uh, entrepreneurs, if you're in an existing vehicle, it means you've already found an arbitrage opportunity, so don't try and do another one, um, unless it's something that feeds your original model. You need someone who you can trust. Like if you're giving someone your money, like, or you're trying to take someone's advice or counsel, you need to trust their intentions. All right. And so it's not just whether they have integrity, it's whether they have your best interest in mind. All right. So I'm going to get to how I solve for that in a second, but that is the first character trait of you need that you need of a counsel of somebody of any kind of counsel, really, whether it's investment law, et cetera. The second um, is efficacy or their skill set, right? So let's think of both. Let's think of different scenarios here. So let's say you might trust your mom implicitly, but she doesn't have the skill of knowing much about, you know, how to structure insurance policies or trusts or, you know, investments in tech startups, right? She might not know how that skill, but you might trust her intention, right? For you specifically. On the reverse of that, you might see that there's this person who's got lots of skill is prodigious in this, but it also means that they know exactly how to screw you if they want to, right? Which is one of the double-sided things of being really good at something, right? You know, all the details, you know how to write the agreement, structure the deals in order to make sure that you, you know, get the best outcome, right? And so the idea is to find someone who has both your best interest at heart and has the ability to deliver on what you want, right? And so it's both of these things. And so you're like, well, yeah, maybe that seems obvious for me. Just even boiling it down to that was very helpful for me because when I look and I look through advisors, look for people I want to get counsel from, I have to look at these two things, all right? So here's how I test for the integrity piece. And here's how you can kind of like, you can uh, control for risk here, right? One is I always try and interview as many advisors as humanly possible, all right? Um, and I do that because I'm gonna get as much information from each of the council during this process that will give me perspective from which to make a judgment, right? One of the biggest problems with this, like if you think about Julie, who's trying to lose weight, right? She goes to the gym and then she talks to this 10 personal trainers. One personal trainer says, it's all about high fat, low carb. Another guy says, hey, don't worry about that keto stuff. It's all about high carb, low fat. And then another guy says, no, you really just need a balanced thing. And then another guy says, it's only about calories. It's only about counting your macros. And so you get this huge perspective perspective so that hopefully you can make a judgment call. Otherwise, when you talk to the first guy and he says, it's all about keto, then you're like, well, I guess this is it, right? I guess these guys all have opinions when in reality, there is a truth. You just don't have the perspective from which to make a judgment yet. And so the first step in this is that I interview as many as, as I possibly can from reputable sources. So this is where I reach out to my network. I make posts, et cetera, to try and get as many referrals as I can. All right. So that's step one. Step two for the integrity piece is that I try and have aligned incentives. Now, a lot of times there are incentive systems that appear aligned, but not are not in reality. So let me give you an example. So in the real estate market, if you're a realtor, for example, you may think, oh, this realtor has my best interest at heart, right? Because they have an incentive to sell the house. And so that is why they're going to get compensated. So they want to sell it for as much as possible. Ah, but they aren't incentivized to sell it for as much as possible. They're incentivized to sell it as fast as possible and get the deal closed, all right? And so think about this. For you, selling a house for $500,000 that's worth $500,000 is a normal, you know, that like that's normal. That's the market price, right? But for you to make an extra, let's say, twenty five thousand or fifty thousand dollars would be really material. That would be a huge extra outcome for you. You would probably push a lot harder to get the extra twenty five or fifty thousand dollars. Now, let's say that um, you could probably sell it in a day at four hundred and fifty thousand dollars because it's below the market value of the house, right? Now, here's what's crazy: is that if a a selling realtor you know, like total, it might be 7%, 2% goes to the buyer and 5% goes to the seller. If 5% is going to your realtor, 5% of $500,000, right, is 25 grand, okay? And so for them, the, the $50,000 decrease to drop you from 500 to 450 means that they're going to give up $2,500. So they're gonna make 22,500. So let me ask you a question. Now, in the reverse, if they sell for five twenty-five, they're going to get twenty-seven thousand five hundred, right? And so it's a five thousand dollars swing off of a you know twenty-five thousand dollars nut for them. And one of them might take them three months, and one of them might take them a day. So what is their incentive? 
their incentive is to get the, is to is to make as much money as possible per unit of time. And so they're incentivized to sell as fast as possible. And so this is one of those things where you have to put your thinking cap on and say, are our incentives truly aligned? And so when we're looking at this, when I say there's two aspects that I look for counselor or somebody who's going to help me do something financially, legally, insurance wise, whatever it is. So first is that integrity piece and are their incentives aligned? The incentives being aligned and you could restructure that deal and say, hey, you know what? You're going to get 0% on anything below $400,000. I'll give you 3% on anything between 400 and 450. And then from 450 and up, I'll give you 20% right? Or 15% or whatever, right? And so now they're highly incentivized to push. And now your incentives are aligned because each increment for you is worth almost as much as it is to them. And that is how you would align incentives. All right. Now, how do you test for the second thing, which is their skill set? This one's hard, all right? Especially if you don't have the perspective from which to make a judgment, which when I enter new things, when I'm trying to learn about trust, when I'm trying to learn about investment things and different vehicles, I'm learning about storage units, I'm learning about multi, like you're like, oh man, there's so much stuff and there's so much nuance that you have to have, right? And so the first thing is I like to usually read two to three books on the topic, all right? And I read two to three books just so I don't appear like an idiot. Um, and so I can at least understand what they're saying and they're going to respect you to, they will, it's kind of like defense. If you bring your, if you bring at least some level of knowledge, they don't feel like they're going to take advantage of you. So this is, this is a first thing that I do. And this is because I don't like feeling exposed in these types of conversations. The second thing you can do is if you have someone that you can trust, you can bring them in alongside you. And the third thing that you can do, which is probably the, the most and highest recommended is repeating the same action I said in the first hand, which is try and talk as to as many of them as possible. And then you will gather the insights and you'll see the people who demonstrate the most expertise. And what you can do is take what one person says and say, well, what about this and see what they reply with. Right. And as you gain more and more knowledge, and this is how you, so in the consulting world, this is qualitative research, right? This is where you're literally doing interviews essentially to gather information so that you can make an informed decision. Right. And so when you do these interviews and this is what, this is the lazy part. This is what most people don't do is they won't do this work, right? They won't take the time to interview 20 people or 10 people. When in reality, these one decisions, the guy who you decide to, you know, invest in, in their fund, or if you decide to buy this building or, or invest in a fund that, that buys X, Y, and Z, right? Or you, or you have somebody who, who manages your portfolio, whatever it is, right? That one decision can be one of the most, if not the biggest influence on your total net worth over a long period of time. And people take more time to figure out what they want to, where they want to go on vacation than where they're going to put their money. Right. And so my ask to you is that if you if you put these put these lenses on, think about both of these lenses. Lens one. Do I think this person is integrous? Do I think this person has my best interest at heart? And then two, do they have the skill to deliver on that promise? Because I don't want my mom doing my investments. I know she has my best at heart, but she has no idea what she's doing. And then I don't want somebody who absolutely knows what they're doing and does not have my best interest at heart. Right. Which honestly, unfortunately, is a lot more of the cases that, that you'll come up with. And candidly, you know, a lot of times they're literally incentivized against you, you know, uh, in, in the insurance industry, they're, they're kind of incentivized to rip you off. It's, it's, it's pretty terrible. And there's a lot of industries like that. Mortgage brokers are incentivized to rip you off. And so you really have to look at it from both lenses. And these types of decisions can make the biggest impact on your net worth and your financial future simply based on who you decide to work with. I would say there are days that I feel like less energized or things like that, for sure. Not about like the big picture of like, I don't believe that this cause is not worthy. But I do think a lot of people have that too, where they're like, what I'm doing is meaningless, right? And then I get into, <laughs> I think everything's meaningless. And then we can just create whatever meaning, you know, we choose to, because if we don't believe in a capital M meaning, which a lot of people disagree with, that's fine. But if you don't believe in a capital N meaning, I think that's very freeing because then you can create little M meaning for whatever you want. And so if you believe you can then choose to architect your own life in whatever ways that you deem meaningful um, and make the activities you do aligned with that meaning. The difference between capital M meaning and little m meaning, and this is kind of like the basis of nihilism, which people have like a very negative viewpoint around, which I'm not entirely sure about why, but like capital M meaning means that like, this is the meaning of life period. Like for everyone, this is the meaning of life. Whereas if we say that there is no single agreed upon meaning of life and then people say, well, then that is your big meaning of life. And I'm like, yes, you're right. I believe that there is no meaning. That is the meaning that I, that I believe. And they're like, well, then that is the capital M. Then sure, that's my capital M meaning is that there is no meaning. What's the implication of that? It means now that we have meaning making machines in our brain and so we get to create and destroy meaning as we see fit. And so if we choose an activity and we deem that goal meaningful because we think it's more interesting or it energizes us, then we can ascribe meaning to that and do more of it. And what's nice about not having capital M meaning is that that can shift, right? That might be good for a season and then it can shift. 
I will say that the downside of not having capital M meaning, which I consider to be religion off the shelf, is that it's more difficult because you have no one who's saying, here's the big box of rules, you can read it, and then that way you don't have to make the decisions about it. But I think it's more difficult, but ultimately more rewarding if you have reasoning behind why you believe what you believe. Because then you have to independently come up with your own conclusions about those things. It also makes it malleable so that if you get new data or new evidence, then you can change your mind, which a lot of people, again, have difficulty with. But like, if you change the information, then it would make sense that if it materially changes the outcome, that you, the way that you believe about something should change. And I think a lot of people identify with their beliefs as a part of themselves, rather than as what I prefer to call them, which is assumptions. Because they work the same way. What's the difference between belief and assumption? Not a lot, right? The only difference is just what we call the word. And so assumptions are based on things that we've observed and then we assume something as a result. And so I would say that beliefs are just assumptions, And but when you call them that, they become less tied to your identity. If you have an assumption, you don't say, <gasps> You challenged my assumption. It's like, well, yeah, you challenged my assumption. Oh, that's great. I, I was assuming this. It must be this. And then they become much more flexible, and then we don't tie our egos into them, and I think ultimately it serves more people better in the long run. A lot of people, I would say, mistakenly think that the number one resource is time, right? Everyone's like, time is money, time is money, time is money. And I would argue that that's not necessarily true. I would argue that attention is money. That is the golden resource. So the billionaire friend that I have, he's actually uh, been helping me on... Um, the new endeavor that we are launching to our gym lords uh, soon, which I think will change the industry. Anyways, he's been helping me with that stuff. But like, here's an example. On his phone, his phone does not ring unless you are already a contact that has been whitelisted. His phone doesn't ring. It's, he's impossible to reach. The more successful, the, more th the, the, the larger your company grows, the more you scale, the more you need to scale. And the only way to scale you is because you do have a finite amount of attention. And so what happens is you have to decrease all of the other things in your life that drain attention because you can have as much time as you want, but if you're not there, you're not potent, you're not able, then you can't get anything done with that time that you're supposedly allocating, which is why a lot of people end up in this in-between state of always everywhere and at the same time nowhere. Right. And so they're they're everywhere, but they're not paying attention to anything. And that's and the reason that it's difficult to focus is because entrepreneurs, the character trait that made us into entrepreneurs is that we're go getters, we're we're risk averse, we're creators, we're innovators, we're builders, right? We have all of those traits. But the difficulty is is that the thing that gets you from zero to one is not the thing that gets you from one to two. Right. And so one of the the reason that you have to totally morph and why you have to be a growth oriented individual is because you have to change your own individual character traits in order to progress as a business owner. And so, like I said, the things that got you here are not the things that are going to get you there. The things that got you here, which is your own internal skills, are not the things that you need to pass on to other people. So the only way that you were able to grow your business at a certain point is by growing other people, right? And the only way you can do that is if you have the attention and the bandwidth in order to do so. And that's why if you look at a business owner and like the more I obsess on looking at billionaires and people who are, who are doing better than we are is I look at how quiet and how clean they keep their space. And I mean that both, both in a literal sense that like their surroundings, their office, their house, their homes, their cell phone, their computers, right? They're, it's, it's, it's quiet, right? Everything, like it's, it's pristine. And when you talk to these people, there's a certain amount of, of tranquility that's there. And, and they, just, they just have very low tolerance. And it's not that they're trying to be impatient with you or impatient with the world. It's just that they understand that they have so like they're, they're operating at such a high level that there's so many things that are demanding of their time and attention that they just like they can't. And so they have to forcibly remove themselves from so many different situations. And I'm going to give you an example. So one of the people that I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat mentoring, right? They had they had four businesses. And this is something that, that happens so many times. It lit, like. Like you want, you want a hundred thousand dollar coaching. This is what happens in hundred thousand dollar coaching sessions. And I'm being honest with you. What happens is someone who's coming in, usually doing between one and $3 million a year, um, can't get past a certain point. Right. And the reason they can't get past is because they only have so much attention and they've spread between four or five different cakes. That's when the gym owner has four gyms and is making less money than they did when they had one gym because the amount of attention that they can allocate to one facility has gone down so much that with fixed costs, they basically are breaking even, right? And so the same thing happens. Now that entrepreneur is probably making one to $3 million in gross revenue, but not taking anything home because they don't have the attention to actually put onto things. And so in order to grow, you need to do less. In order to grow, you need to do less. 
And that comes from both delegation and also choosing what not to do. The better you get, the better the opportunities that you have to say no to. Imagine the level of opportunities that we have now. I'm just being honest. So imagine how many things we could do or try and JV with or do a partnership with or whatever because of the distribution network that we have and the trust and the goodwill that we have with the gym owners um, that we have in our network, right? A lot. I get, I, you know how many people cold message me? Like, I have an opportunity for you. I'm like, really? You have an opportunity for me. And so the better you get, the better your opportunities you have to say no to, which is why becoming a higher and higher and higher level entrepreneur is more and more difficult because it requires discipline. It's not about doing more. It's about doing less because we innately want to do more. So doing more of your own internal characteristic, if that was what it took to get to be more successful then everyone would be more successful because it would be something that does not take effort because that is something that we already do. It's like, man, I outwork anyone. I've got all this work with it. Cool. That gets you from zero to one. It's not going to get you any further than that. So stop identifying with that. It was something that I used to identify with. I was like, I'll, I'll, I'll outwork anyone. I'll, blah, 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 whatever. Like That was something that I used to think about. And it was a character trait. It was an identity thing. And the more you grow, the more you realize that your identity needs to be fluid because what it needs to be is exactly what it needs to be at that given time of development. Because the character traits that I'm going to have to emphasize in a year are going to be different than the ones that I have to emphasize now. The skills that you need to learn like delegation, leadership. Those are things that are not the things that take you in the beginning. You have to be independent. You have to be uh, hustling. You have to be grinding. You have to be willing to put in the work because no one else will do it for you, especially if you have no capital to start, which most of the people who are on here are in that situation. To reel this back in, the number one thing that you have to be paying attention to is where you are paying your attention, right? Like you spend attention. That's why they call it paying attention. It's because it is a resource and most people don't pay attention to that, right? And so one of the things that a lot of people don't know about me, this one's going to go long. Um, <laughs> a lot of the, some of the things that a lot of people don't know about me is that I, for nine months, paid a coach to teach me one thing, which was to manage my attention, it was to teach me how to think. And so for 90 minutes, every single day, all I did was talk about what I was thinking about. Think about that. Every day, I paid attention to where my attention was. And when I did that, all of a sudden, my business blew up, right? And I realized that I had toxic relationships. I had toxic relationships with parents. I had toxic relationships with friends or pseudo friends, things that, I, that were taking my attention, past things that I had on my mind that I knew I had not handled. So those are called like open loops or open cycles, right? So when you have something that you're like, I haven't resolved this then you need to handle that and you'll get that attention back because what happens is you have this bowl, this tiny little bowl of marbles and each of those marbles is a, is, is a unit of attention, right? If you had to measure it. And so you put little marbles of attention on your childhood traumas. You put little marbles of attention on your marriage. You put little uh, marbles of attention on your health. You put little marbles of attention on your spirituality and then massive marbles of attention on your business. But the thing is, is that sometimes you need to quiet and collect all of these other little marbles so that you have more potency, more potential energy, more potential units of attention to spend on the one thing that you're trying to grow, which in this case would be your business. And what's interesting is that what happens is that things that were perceived as difficult become really easy. And I don't know if you've ever had this happen, but like if you were in college or you were in high school and you were like, man, I can't solve this problem, this math problem, and you were exhausted, and then you go to bed, and then you wake up the next morning. And then all of a sudden it seems really easy. Or you're like, I don't know why I didn't see that before. Because attention gives you the ability to see, right? Like if, you're, if you think about wisdom, right? Wisdom is an ability to see what other people cannot see, right? Two people are presented in the same situation. The wiser person sees things that the other person doesn't. And how can you see better? You see better if you have more ability to see, which comes from your most valuable resource, attention. How much horsepower do you have? And so look at the things that you have in your, in your life right now. Like if I see someone who has a messy relationship life, who's got a messy love life, who goes out every weekend and gets trashed, right? Like I can tell you billionaires don't do that. That like the whole Tony Stark, like vision of the entrepreneur is a farce. It's not true. Don't believe that. Every single billionaire, every single high level entrepreneur is quiet, unbelievably quiet. They keep themselves completely isolated. They have a bubble around them of, of layers of protection. They're like, like for me, it's, it's me and then there's Layla and then we have our COO and then we have our executive assistant team because we have a team of EAs at this point. We have four, 
um, who work the next level, there's no one who has direct access to me, including our employees. No one does. And that's because it's, it would disserve you, you guys, our gym owners, if everyone had access to me. The reason that I don't respond to Facebook messages is not because I don't want to. It's because I literally can't. And if I did, I would be disturbing everyone because then my attention would be split because someone can't generate leads in their market or whatever. You know what I mean? Like, because these little things, these little things that are perceived as huge issues to you in that moment, because you have a little bit of attention, you, you have so little left that everything seems like an explosion. But when you have lots of capacity, big problems seem small and small problems seem big. And it sounds reverse because what you do is you start seeing that all of these things are attention drains and you just say, I don't want to play anymore. And you stop playing. We think that for some reason we are doing something wrong when we are not self-caring because it is bad to not self-care because we should, we must, or else, or what. And the reason this pisses me off, the reason that I made a, a tweet that went viral um, this morning about this is that weekends are new for humans. They're not even 100 years old. 1929 in England is when the first weekend got passed by a union. And it's because people hated what they were doing for their life. And so if you want to truly give self-care, then stop hating what you do every day. Novel concept, I know. Stop hanging out with people that suck. Mind blowing, like I said, I know. And the reason that I am so passionate about this is that I have been told throughout my entire life that I was working too much, I was not balancing the things that I was supposed to be balancing. And you know what, who gives a shit? It's my life, I don't need to live by anyone else's rules and neither do you, right? And so when people say you should be doing this, you are not doing X, Y, Z, just take a pause and be like, are these rules that I want to listen to? Are those your rules that you're trying to apply to my life? Because there are no rules. You can do whatever the hell you want. If you want to work for a year straight, work for a year straight. And the reason you can work for a year straight is because you like what you do. The reason these people try and project their own self-hatred for their own lives onto you is because they cannot imagine a world in which someone might actually like what they do every day and didn't, don't need an escape, a break from what their existence is on a daily basis. And so don't feel guilty for just being you. And if you don't like your life every day, rather than try and figure out and make time for self-care, it would probably be better to flip the ratio and start thinking, what can I do in my actual life to stop hating it so much that I need an escape from it, right? And that's different from like, yes, you need to sleep. Yes, you need to, you know, rest, etc. But there's a difference between that and like, ugh. I just need a total spa day. And if that's how you relax, cool. But the thing is, is projecting on someone else how they should, must, need to, have to relax or do whatever, it's nonsensical. It doesn't exist, right? I wanted to make this video, even though it's short, because I, it just drives me bananas. If you wanna work, work. If you wanna take off, take off. Just don't listen to what anyone else says about what you should do for your life. You're going to die and so will they. And it's not going to matter. And in 10 generations, don't even remember your name. So do what you want. You're going to die. And that is the ultimate freedom. And for some reason, we live under these chains that we think exist, but don't. And so I think the process of, of growing and, and really making ourselves free is just simply identifying the things that don't really exist and only existed in our mind to begin with. And I think that's why self-care really bugs the shit out of me, or this whole self-care movement. It's also soft as f Like, just work, right? To get it done. You need know, to like give yourself a f bubble bath every day because like your work's so hard. Like humans have been here a very long time. We've dealt with much, much harder your, you know, boss having a deadline the next day is not the worst that you've been through. And so as a final sign off on this, think about the hardest things that you've been through in your life. Everyone has gone through hardship. Everyone has had difficulties in childhood. Everyone has had difficulties with siblings, with parents, blah, 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 these events that shape our lives. You have been through harder than this. You will survive. It will be okay. You don't need to self-care. You don't need to listen to what anyone else is saying. You do you. And if that means self-care, by all means, but just don't project it on anyone else. When I started in this business, I took every single sale and it was because I was so afraid that somebody would waste the opportunity. So if you have that fear, I understand where you're coming from. Second, when I had my first sale that was not me, I, I just had this emotional breakdown because I was like, oh my God, this could actually happen. And I promise you, if you haven't had it happen yet, you will when it does because you realize that this business can actually work without you and other people can make it rain too, right? And then I'll tell you a quick story that, that illustrate the next point that I'm going to make. So as I you know, hired some salespeople, now that first salesperson, were they exceptional? No, but they were able to get the job done. Later on, I had my first kind of like killer um, and his name was Mauro Negretti. And he, uh, he came in, I don't know, a year or two into the business, a year into the business. And he 
so quickly was able to assume the sales role. And to, to show you how laughable this is, he started and I was about to start training him and some lady walked in the door and I was like, hey man, like I can take, it. he's like, no, I'm good. He's like, go do your thing. He's like, fitness nutrition accountability. Okay, I'll, I'll figure it out. And he ended up closing this first lady who walked in the door for a paid in full. And I remember walking in like completely dumbstruck. I was like, he didn't even know what the pitch was. But she walked out giggling, happy, so excited to start. And what that moment taught me was that it is good to train salespeople, but it's better to take great salespeople and then just point them in a direction. And so this has informed a lot of the thinking that I have around talent in general. And I'll tell you a couple of frameworks that have informed this. But like, if you look at Harvard, Harvard doesn't produce the smartest people. They select the smartest people and then they put smart uh, professors in front of them. But like the base level of intelligence of everyone who's at Harvard is already exceptionally high. And so like even if the teachers at Harvard were not exceptional, the students are and they would be successful independent of that because their selection is so ridiculous. Right. And so if we can think about our own companies that way, and especially if you're in the service business, like look at the biggest service companies out there, like look at McKinsey, look at Bain, look at BCG, look at basically a lot of the finance world is or, or service based businesses a lot of times. Right. And they're able to do that because they create such a pool to select from that they are able to skim for the best talent. Right. I heard this uh, quote from uh, Esther. Kathy, who's the founder of Chick-fil-A, you win the championship in the draft. And so it was such a belief that they had about picking the right people even more so than training. And I would say that I have moved in that direction of a little bit more nature than nurture when it comes to roles, specifically sales, especially. There are certain characteristics about building rapport, about having certain, you know, dynamics or energy, whatever you want to say, that like Martin Negretti, when he walked in, he had all of these things and he didn't even know the pitch, but he won that sale off of just pure rapport. And so if I'm going to allocate the same level of time to training somebody, I might as well start with somebody who has a much higher base because I could spend 10 hours to take someone from a two to a four and a half, or I could spend the same 10 hours taking someone from a six to a nine. And the thing is, I'm also going to get more bang for my buck in terms of my hours of training with somebody who has nat a natural proclivity for selling compared to somebody who does not. What's interesting about this, and this is just like my observation, is that you just have to be willing to talk to more people in the uh, recruiting process. I will say, like from a recruiting standpoint, there's there's two kind of things to look out for. If you're if you're if you cannot pay super handsomely based on your price points, which you need to maybe fix later. But like, if you can't pay super well for the salesperson, then you need to look harder and you'll need to interview more people and you'll need to probably run ads and use your network. If you can pay well, the best salespeople are already employed. And so it comes down to recruiting those salespeople from other sales jobs, ideally from companies just like yours, so that they already know a lot of the things coming into it. So it decreases the ramp up time for them because all we're really doing is swapping products and the actual sales cycle, the type of sale, is it a transactional sale, is it a long sale, is it a software sale, is it a coaching program sale, whatever it is, right? There's so few variables that we're changing that they can immediately jump and go, which also allows you to make a judgment on their proficiency faster. And so as a quick side note to this, because this is something that I've given a lot of thought, if you look at the top salespeople and sales trainers, and this is going to drive point, drive home the point that I was making earlier about it being much of it being born, all right, is that if you look at the top people who are in the space, you look at Jordan Belfort, right? You look at Bradley, you look at, um, and some people would, would, would say me in terms from a selling perspective, all the guys that I know who have taught sales were exceptional salespeople day one. Bradley started selling cars when he was 18 years old and was the top salesman at 18 years old when he started. And he was like, I just found something I was really good at. Jordan Belford talks about how he didn't know how to train anybody in his book. And then all of a sudden he, for the first time ever, wrote out a framework to explain the straight line sales system, which became his book and all that kind of stuff. But he, up to that point, it was just what he naturally did, right? And I can tell you in my instance as well, I'd already closed thousands of deals before I even consumed my first sales training. And so like, I do think that if we are selecting salespeople, 
I think it's much more about selection than it is about training. The training is to remind them how good they are, not necessarily to make them good. All right, and this is something that has shifted over time for me specifically. Now, if you're like, well, I suck at sales, you can absolutely put way more time into yourself than a business would reasonably put into an employee. All right, like you have you all the time. So you can train you in all your off hours and you're spending your own time to invest in yourself. But from a return on investment perspective, it's the cost of finding a good salesperson compared to the cost of training a bad or mediocre salesperson is significantly lower. It's much easier to find the right people than it is to take somebody and then make such a crazy extensive training unless your entire model is we just take on every single person who walks in the door, like 24 Hour Fitness has this model. They take on anybody who has a pulse and then they put them through a ridiculous culling process and then 10% of people make it in the first 90 days. I've said this quote many times in our communities and on this channel, which is, you must outwork your self-doubt, right? If you feel like you are not confident, then you must outwork the things that you're insecure about. If you're like, man, I'm selling these services and I don't show, I'm not sure if I'm that good at them, then do more of them and don't pretend. Honesty is one of the most compelling and convicting things for persuading people, right? Saying what you are good at and what you are not good at truthfully will win you far more followers and fans and, and loyal customers and loyal employees than pretending. Because at the end of the day, they can feel that you are disingenuous because they know that it is hollow. They know that on the inside, you do not believe the words that are coming out of your mouth. And that is how people speak without conviction and they cannot sway others because they have not swayed themselves because they have lost their own respect. And so I am not the believer in buying the Ferrari when you can't afford it. I am not the believer in, in affording the home and paying for the home that you cannot afford because you want to pretend like this is the lifestyle that you want to be around. If you go into the guise of networking, you can still go to those places without buying a $4 million house when you, you're barely making you know a few hundred thousand dollars a year. It doesn't make sense. I like Jay-Z's quote around this, which is, if you can't buy something twice, don't buy it once. I really like that. And so, this is one of the most common questions I get for newer entrepreneurs because they think that they have to, they have to, they have to pose on Instagram in order to get, to, to get wealthy. And what it does is it conflates sequence. Jeff Bezos is famous because of what he did, not because he became famous as Jeff Bezos and then used his following to build something. Elon Musk is famous for what he's accomplished, not for being Elon Musk and then creating something as a result, right? Let the actions be the thing that gives you the fame rather than yourself. Right? At least that is, that is Alex's two cents in my viewpoint in the world. And I think most of Mosey Nation, you guys uh, share that belief with me. And for those of you who are new to this channel, um, you're going to get more of this type of stuff uh, and none of the uh, fake it till you make it nonsense. That is a sure way uh, to be broke. And I will tell you this as a last thing. The amount of people who in 2008, when everything crashed, who were faking it until they quote made it, just faked it until they lost it all because they lost what little amount that they had because they were so overextended. But I can tell you that just about everyone can become wealthy if you choose to live on lower, on less than you make, right? And that is a ratio. Wealth is a ratio, not a number, all right? And so, anywho, uh, if you are having struggles with this question, I would posit, I would, I would beg of you that you build your own respect first that you're honest with yourself first. And if you always maintain the integrity of, hey, last year we, we got smashed, right? This year we'll do a little bit better. And two years from now, when you do even better than that, you can be truthful and people will believe you. But if you always are telling a story about how you're always doing so well, A, everyone will hate you, B, no one cares, and C, you will know that you are full of it. And at the end of the day, I think that is the only thing that we're gonna keep with us. And when we die, everyone's gonna forget about us anyways. So you might as well at least enjoy yourself while you're alive. Because you made it this far in a video, I wanna celebrate you. Most people start and don't finish. Most people never actually follow through. Most people say they want something, but they don't ever do the work to actually get it. But you are different. You are special. Believe Nation, you made it here all the way to the end and I love you. So as a special celebration, if you put a hashtag believe down in the comments below on this video, I will showcase you and celebrate you somewhere on the screen in a future video because you are awesome. For 10 more amazing roofs and Simon Sinek, check the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe and I'll see you there. And if you truly aren't failing as you're trying to innovate, then you're probably not pushing very hard because you haven't broken anything. You're making very, very safe choices. We could never have put a person on the moon without a bunch of rockets blowing up first. Like, I met a CFO once. I asked him the priorities of the company, and he said, efficiency and innovation.